Well, thank you very much. And it's a huge privilege to be here, and it's a huge privilege to receive this award. Uh, it's, um, it's something I, I really wasn't expecting until I, I received the communication uh, just not much more than a month or so ago. I'd like to thank uh, the uh, director of the DPRI and the uh, deputy directors and all the staff involved in the DPRI. I think it's the most amazing institution and it's been a great privilege to do many visits here. And uh, I, I think uh, you've got uh, a long future. I told my uh, boss back in the UK, I said, uh, well, actually, I'm uh, going to receive an award from what I believe is probably the biggest uh, research institute in this subject area and certainly uh, the oldest in the world. And so there was no debate as to why I would be leaving the UK at this time of year when we have a very busy program. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I've been asked to give a presentation and I'm going to talk about progress and prospects for action data in people-centered disaster risk reduction. And this is going to uh, look backwards at some, some of the work I was involved with some years ago, um, but bringing it right up to the present. And you know, I want to sort of consider uh, data all over again, because I think we're working in an area where we all use data, we're all largely dependent on data, but we're all facing similar types of questions, which is how effective is our research? What is the impact of what we do? Uh, what data works. So this presentation is based on that theme and it's uh, really recognizing the challenges there are in making data be more impactful and useful for reducing disaster risk. At the same time, in recognizing the challenges, I think we have uh, opportunities to do a lot more and we've come a long way and much of our data is actually um, having a lot of uh, impact and making a big contribution. So I don't want to offend in any way if I'm questioning you know, how, how good is our data and how good is our work. It's really only to say, well, you know, we're all in the same situation and uh, we need to do better as we go forward. So I come from the Disaster and Development Network at Northumbria University. And uh, the reason I put this slide in is, is not to, to flag another network. I'm also uh, deeply involved with uh, the Global Alliance of Disaster Research Institutes, uh, the UK Alliance of Disaster Research Institutes, and so forth. But it's because it says disasters and development. And that's the most important thing about that. Um, that, that, that uh, title we put on this some years ago at Northumbria was to look at all things where development and change over time is linked to disaster outcomes or disaster prevention. This is a fairly common type of language these days, fortunately. In a way, we've won the ideological battle of putting development issues together with disaster risk issues. This is now um, encapsulated in the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Sustainable Development Goals, and other uh, parts of the 2015 to 2030 agenda. But, but we're now facing the question as to why aren't we having more impact quicker in those agendas? And hence the need for thinking about action. And when we are doing our science and when we are doing our practice and policy work, we need to be thinking about action data. So good data, there's a rationale to this, and the good data is a basis for improved decision making towards achieving the global targets. I think the, when we look at data, the first thing we usually think is better data will make a difference. This is true, but there's a lot more to the story. Actions for disaster rich, risk reduction are currently not proportionate to the data available, the second observation. So we have vast amounts of data, and we're collecting more data more efficiently, faster, and yet that data is not translating into the type of change we want to see in terms of reducing disaster risk. So therefore we need to rethink how data reduces disaster risk in practice and for the more sustainable and resilient futures we are all hoping for. So action-orientated data 
needs to be considered as almost a campaign, a voice that enables people to engage disaster risk reduction. But we need to stick with some of the basics as well. And data is a form of measurement. We use, we use data for measurement. But when we reflect on what we mean by measurement, then it becomes quite complicated very fast. And uh, some of, as I say, um, some, some of this story, from the way I'm looking at it, looks back at my own uh, work in the past. I started out in quite a quantitative tradition. I was actually, first and foremost, a long time ago, a, a surveyor. I was measuring land and infrastructure. And then I reinterpreted that into a form of geography, and it became human geography, and then I moved into uh, medical geography and health-centered approaches and the whole risk and uh, vulnerability and hazard landscape has been part of that, a lot of that story. So I think I, I know what I'm talking about when I say measuring something, but how far can this go? Disaster risk reduction requires measuring the future as well to assess change for sustainable quality of life. And as soon as, as, soon as we talk risk and we look into the future, we are faced with a lot of challenges. We are often trying to assess or predict something which has not happened before. So how do we measure uh, context as well? The context uh, we understand as being complicated. And then future contexts, even harder to try and understand. So the question is what can and can't be measured and how we can, can we use both for this agenda? Disaster risk is Partly about speculation, therefore, about what might happen. There is persistent problems of complexity rendering some risk as immeasurable. Hence, action data. Action data is a reflective learning, practice, and conjecture for improved engagement with current and future risk. So, now going into uh, this, look, looking at what we have and what do we do with our data, some examples. Uh, moving backwards and forwards. So this uh, is, is some early work in the uh, medical geographical type of tradition, but also trying to look at risk. And I suppose what we notice from this type of example is that we are orientated by uh, using our data in place, spatially, and also when we add in a temporal dimension, dimension we get the possibility of uh, bringing the cross-sectional type of uh, analysis together with the longitudinal analysis. And this has become this simple uh, representation of it from some early work looking at uh, um, risk of an infectious disease over a landscape. Um, this type of approach now, of course, has become increasingly more sophisticated. We use uh, data which is active right down to very small pixelated areas and we can attribute quantitatively and qualitatively a, a risk value onto these sub-areas. Data on, in the longitudinal sense can be something where we look at correlation between different phenomena, how, phenomena and how they change over time. This was from work earlier on looking at uh, changing uh, weather and climate uh, situations in part of southern Africa and I'll refer to this example a few times during this presentation. So in this early uh, part of the analysis, we look at uh, rainfall over time compared with an infectious disease for which there is an association with water and climate. It's the cholera um, infectious disease. It's one of the diarrheal diseases, and you'd expect to see this in the background data, some type of association. So when it's wetter, you can expect to see uh, more cases of the disease. And this keeps going each year. But it becomes a pattern, and it's background data. Then we need to know why is it like that. Other examples here from uh, West Africa, the distribution of malaria cases and rainfall. And of course, if we have this sort of record of what, what's been happening over time, we can then start to try to model into the future, don't we, to predict what we think will happen. But that's where it starts to become quite limited and the predictions become complex because there are so many factors involved 
After all, a disease is, is, a, uh, a, um, is a hazard, or a pathogen that causes a disease is a hazard working with people, and people move around, and people uh, behave in different ways. People are complicated. So as soon as we put the social and the ecological together, we are trying to do something quite challenging. And when we look into the future, we don't know. So this example um, came to the conclusion that probably there would be a lower risk of malaria in West Africa with climate change in the future because areas will become drier. But we simply don't know for sure that might not happen. So we try to go deeper and further into uh, the question of what causes what, the cause and effect relationship, and we consider more and more factors and we measure more. And uh, with this project now back in Mozambique, in, that's in Southeast Africa, uh, we're looking here at infectious disease risk. And this project I like to refer to because it was one of the earlier ones, I think, which led to many things which happened later. But it tried to take a more comprehensive approach by using spatial analysis, uh, temporal analysis, but also speaking to people and in identifying a range of different types of uh, risk indicators. Using this type of approach, we um, can look at it in a, a multi-leveled way as well, spatially, temporally, and, but also at uh, a, a large uh, scale of analysis right down to, in this case, a micro scopic scale of analysis. But it's part of the same process of trying to identify risk where, when, and with whom. So this is looking in, at uh, algae in a pond on the one hand, and it's looking at the advance of a cyclone on the other. And each of these are relevant parts of the story in understanding why the risk of a cholera epidemic might change over time. In fact, this is based in some core uh, science in this case, microbiological science, I should say, at the um, microbiological level because the Vibrio, which is the bacteria which is the hazard that causes this type of disease, was found to be able to hide within phytoplankton. So if we monitor the phytoplankton in the pond and how that changes over time, we might get an indication of when risk is, is changing on the basis of the, the hazard, the dynamic hazard there is. But it only becomes a, a, a disease epidemic, or let's call it a disaster, if the um, susceptibility of the people is sufficiently low to be affected by it. So there's a long story to this, and I won't go into the detail of an individual uh, sort of project approach, because I want to get the, the big story behind this. And uh, if you look down the left-hand side of this table, you'll find that the origins of, the, of cholera risk is therefore um, multi-dimensional. It's pathogenic, that is the bacteria at microscopic level. There is the clinical epidemiological side of the story amongst people, the susceptibility to being infected there is the type temporal climatic change of risk. There is the spatial differentiation and the environmental change. There are the socioeconomic factors. And this table goes on. Uh, it goes further. It becomes behavioral. Depends what people choose to do or not choose to do. Uh, what they're able to choose to do and not able to choose to do. There's the perception of what a risk might be. And a whole strand of work in disaster risk reduction going back decades has considered perception almost as important as the real. The key part is at the end here, multivariate influences. So the background knowledge for advancing uh, any, any program to intervene in this type of risk needs to recognize the multiple influences there are and that these are interrelated with each other. Moreover, two or more influences on cholera incidents are likely to be more than the sum of their respective parts, i.e. the presence of more than one risk at one time multiplies the level of risk exponentially rather than a cumulative adding of risks. Now, I'm referring to one type of hazard, but this is a knowledge which can be transferred to other types of hazards as well. 
So what I've just said is that if we're looking at the underlying causes and how they add up, add up there's likely to be a social aspect, an economic as aspect, an ecological aspect. Of course, you could go on a, a geophysical aspect, a climatic aspect, and so forth in most of our hazard-related uh, phenomena. But what we do appreciate is that it's not going to be uh, a simple addition. It becomes a multiplier effect. More things about data which we need to reflect on. There's, looking at this in terms of the, the benefit cost of collecting more data, uh, there is a relationship. So we, our enterprise, if you like, uh, we are about trying to reduce uncertainty and it costs time and money, and energy and uh, emotions to get more and more information and data. I think the, um, benefit we get is that we reduce uncertainty. But what this graph is showing that the quantity of information can be sometimes uh, questionable in the long run. So there's a reduced rate of return. I'm not suggesting we stop collecting data, not in, in any way would I be suggesting that. But we need to be aware of where our, what type of data and the quality of our data where it is um, producing a reduced rate of return. I should say off. So a reduced rate of return is that gap between the cost of getting more and more data and when it's not necessarily producing so much return. It did at first, but then we might need to collect a different type of data, move from what we're used to doing to doing something a little bit different. So. Ultimately, we are looking at any type of situation where we have a, a hazard becoming a major threat and where there is uncertainty and where there is change. And uh, this picture is just one that I've, I've have available for some time, but actually it could have been taken earlier this week or last week in the UK where we've got these flash floods from storms have been becoming increasingly prevalent. Uh, the damage is becoming quite extreme and um, people are starting to think much more in a systemic way about this so it's not a one-off event but there's something systematic happening and of course is it the climate climate change but it's also about the way infrastructure has not adapted to these changes as well so we need data which is part of a system and m m much of our work is about systems analysis and then this would apply for other types of issues, like uh, the, these are fires on the moors, but actually I think this particular picture, they're all from the UK in this instance, is the mass burning of livestock due to infectious disease some years ago, the foot and mouth epidemic. And uh, we have uh, social change, we have political economic change going on, and this can all be happening sometimes in the same place. So what sort of um, systemic approach to data is required? Clearly more integration um, and more attention to the quality of what we're actually um, collecting. I think ultimately we're asking what is the utility of our data? So action data is really all these, it's concerned with all of these um, aspects of, of data and ultimately we come back to the same sort of question which is what is the utility. So I'm sure you've got plenty of your own examples and uh, from, from the work you've been doing. And I have some um, evidence to say that in asking this question about what data works, so what works and then what data works, looking at the end point, where are we making progress, what science, information, education contributed to this solution, and as we go back almost forensically, we can identify which data contributed and why. 
So it's useful, I suppose, um, against a number of criteria. This are some of the criteria which seem to make sense from the basis of some of these uh, projects of working with groups of people and addressing uh, everyday hazards. If it indicates genuine information, users of information are defined. We need to uh, ask whether it serves for decision making, reflects change over time, and informs the results of decision making. And of course, this is an iterative process, an ongoing evaluation. Our monitoring and evaluation um, uh, systems need to be based on in-depth research, not just collecting the same data repetitively, because we've got used to that type of uh, approach. So uh, that this requires uh, capacity. to be able to um, have impact. And so action data is, in one way, it's a derivative of uh, something which has been around a long time. Action research is a form of research where you engage with your research with an expected outcome, but you, you change your expected outcomes on the basis of what you find out. There are actually a, diff a few different versions of action research, and uh, I'm sure some of you have noted from early on in this, this uh, action data story that it must have something to do with action research. Well, it does, but uh, it's a little bit different really now because we're dealing in a data-intensive environment like we've never been in before. So if we keep uh, the action research part of it, then we'd be talking about capacity building and who engages in knowledge and information and the collecting of data, transferred and consolidated appropriate technology enabled localized disease risk assessment, we're now back on that case study of the infectious disease risk reduction. So what happened with some of the, the, this earlier type of uh, project I was involved with, particularly in Southern Africa, but also partly in South Asia, was we started to get the, the, the um, array of indicators and mass collection of data to be something which was more embedded in local groups of people. And what we started to, to realize amongst working with local authorities, local research groups, and this entire process of localization started to lead to more change and impact. So data which is embedded as part of a process of change within uh, the problem area itself. And eventually, if we're going to have active data, which has, is um, bringing about change, this becomes part of a system. Uh, this version of it, there are many uh, types of data systems which are going to help reduce disaster risk, but there has been quite a lot of recognition of what started to become called community-based disaster risk management. The question of community is always there, uh, I'm starting to prefer to uh, refer to locally based disaster risk management because the assumption of community is sometimes a little bit overrated. Often people are not living as community in today's world. Sometimes they are. In this particular lo location uh, in uh, Mozambique where some of the, this early work was uh, based, there was a sense of community. So we could say community based. But the point being that the data is involved in this process of communicating risk. Where does the data come from? It can come from within the, um, the community itself over here. And then it needs to be organized through some type of community or committee type of arrangement of information, uh, recycling of information, but also the verification of, of this uh, information. And that requires sometimes anything from quite uh, routine uh, based quantitative or qualitative analysis through to sometimes using the most advanced type of technology or science we have available to understand uh, you know, the, the, um, a, a genetic change within a, a pathogenic risk, for example, might it even, it could strain to the um, extent to understanding what, what sort of uh, substrain of the disease hazard 
is actually prevalent in different types of areas. So it's all different levels of uh, and types of science involved in this process, but fundamentally it's the link with what's going on within the local area which is going to bring the action research, the impact, the change that we want to see. So communication, ultimately people are going to be involved in using the information. So in this example I've been using this morning, we end up with uh, committees of people, groups of people, some in the community, some who are responsible for uh, their area and some who are assisting, in this case from a medical school or uh, um, these are health students, um, and they started getting involved in the community. So using uh, different types of emergency health and, and risk management approaches, these students became involved in their own local community. And what we saw was the uh, rates of infection from epidemic was, was going down uh, each year during this process. So it had impact. This is a city um, well, Mozambique is, is in southeast Africa, and this particular city is, is Beira, the second city, and it has a long history of repetitive uh, diarrheal disease epidemics due to its, its uh, physical location, due to its socioeconomic status. So action data then, therefore, knowing when it's impactful information that we have, um, if there is sufficient data in the first place, so one of the problems with, with the question on data is sometimes a lack of data, but then it moves on to be more to do about whether the data is being um, communicated. Is it possible to communicate this data? If it's quite a sophisticated type of data, how can we translate it into a form where it's more usable? It needs to be a participatory type of uh, data, and it needs to be a data that has impact, data as a type of voice. In relation to um, it's application for lived action data. If this works, we, we moved on uh, over the, the years with this um, quite integrated approach to looking at different types of indicators and therefore different types of data to recognizing that the complexity is often too great to be able to manage and therefore we need to understand how people can protect, them, protect themselves even when they don't have all the indicators or all the information. So this story gradually starts to shift at this point. So this simple model here is it's a, a type of, um, it's a little bit like now we have in the Sendai framework the uh, priority action number four which is to build back better. So this was, a, 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 if you like, an early version of that type of uh, uh, thinking where at point B there we are uh, in, in a reduced state of well-being and survivability due to the, uh, the onset of a, a hazard event causing a disaster and then X is the uh, sort of recovery period and we end up hoping to be stronger next time around. We're looking into the future however and this is where the uncertainty comes in. So what happens when we can't measure it and we can't get the data? So the uncertainty increases as we look into the future. We become reliant on other phenomena than just what we collected in terms of the evidence last time around. So we can archive our data as evidence, but then we become increasingly reliant on um, our consciousness and I would argue non-experiential, not that which is not experienced. And we start to communicate in that way. Of course, this can become a political uh, sort of space in which we choose what we want to believe and what we want to acknowledge. We can deny what the risks are in the future. We can say, for example, climate change is not happening and just ignore it. We could choose to do that. So this is a cultural matter. It means where are we coming from in terms of dealing with uncertainty? I suppose in its um, clearest description, we could say, well, we need to be more precautionary. And there is in environmental management for decades, there has been this sort of idea of the precautionary principle. So we may not have all the evidence. We don't have all the data, but we should act on what we do have and, be, and take the precautions. 
How much precaution you take will depend on where you're coming from. The positivistic uh, science on the one hand or some sort of uh, belief on the other. And of course the real world we operate in is, is uh, driven by much other than positive science alone. So we're ultimately embracing uncertainty or we're resisting uncertainty. Okay, so this future looking of warning response processes will remain difficult to measure. Well, if you try to understand um, a, a cat, uh, you can consider well, what part of the cat would you measure? And uh, you're probably working in a, an academic institution are used to the, uh, the accusation of trying to organize academics. It's like herding sheep. So they all go, want to go off in their own direction. It's not a, um, a fixed quantity. And we've got the whole issue of interpretation. Who's hearing what? Who's understanding what? Who's believing what? Personalizing, confirming, and deciding and responding. This is well known in our sector. This is the whole dynamic of the social side of an early warning system. So we need to think of how this translates into decision making and uh, our ultimate aim is the more stable disaster threat in the top right hand corner. We could opt for managing the uncertainty more or we can say well we will accept the uncertainty and we will build, we will be precautionary, we will build resilience. I suppose an ideal path might be something like what is going through the middle there which is accepting some uncertainty reducing it as much as we can where it is useful to do so, but overall we want to reduce our exposure, our vulnerability. Okay, so this type of thinking is, is uh, getting recognized more, I think, and reflected to some extent, at least, in global, at global level policy as well. So we have global agreements and you'll find the uh, decision making based on good data uh, aspect reflected in the Sendai framework. I'll move quite rapidly through this part. There are demands for data, and, uh, but they're, they're largely non-systemic. But it's about monitoring. Okay, so we have the, uh, the targets of the Sendai framework, and then we have um, the expectation that we're going to be able to monitor that using more data. So I've got quite involved with this process with the uh, Sendai framework through the uh, U UNDRR science and technology um, group and uh, they wanted me to sort of basically convene this uh, working group on data and that's one of the reasons why, why data has become very much part of my discussion off late whilst we've been doing this. And it reached a point in the global platform last year, uh, 2019, where a, a statement was made emphasizing uh, this. Comprehensive and disaggregated data harnessed across time and space is, space is crucial to effectively define exposure and vulnerability, particularly for those most at risk. We need to make better use of existing data for information and action. So I think some of this work, uh, at least with the, the, the data working group of the science and technology advisory group, is, is um, now sort of recognized in a, a policy type of uh, area. And of course the challenge will be how much more can we offer going forward in terms of an action data type of approach. So this is uh, really just the start of a long story of getting action orient orientated a framing of disaster risk reduction data to be disaster risk reduction relative to data available. So in the top right hand corner there, relative to data available, I suppose this is the optimistic view that we have a lot of data or we have huge capacity to get more data and the question is how are we going to make that data achieve disaster risk reduction. So it may be a reworking of data processes that influence risk reduction. Certainly data for global disaster reduction and policy and practice at the, the bottom there 
uh, is the other emphasis. And I think that part is more um, reflected in the current 2015-2030 uh, framework. We have this part now being advocated and that perhaps here is where uh, you know, the, the uh, science and academic uh, community needs to go further in thinking about the data processes which are going to affect change. That's not straightforward. So action data processes, what's, we can start with some, some clear um, statements. I only agreed to get involved in that particular process actually if we would uh, agree that data has to be visual, narrative and numeric, not just one or the other. So we, we don't want any um, stuck in any particular um, tradition of, of knowledge creation where we only recognize the narrative um, as would be in some extreme versions of um, social science perhaps. Similarly, to only recognize numeric data would be limiting. So visual narrative and numeric data are all part of this process. Data is information. Of course, there's always this question, and it's, this is now just partly language, so let's not worry too much, but is data the same as information? Well, in, in the English language, apparently, um, information is, is meaning given to data by the way in which it is interpreted. But then I suppose that's just what we're saying with action data, data which has an effect or has some meaning. So there's varying approaches to action research for disaster risk reduction through, but each of these requiring active data. And I think the action data might be um, quite a useful way of thinking about it. So data realms are recognizably in disaster risk reduction policy and practice agendas. So the second sort of um, important point really is beyond recognizing the different types of uh, data there may be, is also to try and put it into the sector in, in uh, an understanding of the different aspects we are, are talking about here. And so this has come up in the re report that I've produced for the UN on this topic, uh, which isn't released uh, yet. There's a draft um, just here under my notes. But it's got some of the basic things in it to get this underway. Again, and most, a lot of it's not sort of new knowledge, but there's some new emphases and new things that need to be done. So there's these different aspects of data as listed in that, the, the three points. There's risk-related data, loss-related data, and then capacity-related data. So this um, form was, w w went out for um, people to, to engage with and think about numeric, narrative, and visual data across these dimensions of loss, risk, and capacity. And we have some results from there. I haven't um, got these to release at this, this point. So this is ongoing. And, uh, you know, it's where does it go next, I think, is, is to try to assist in some way on getting data to be more active. Now, just a bit more about this, this, the three different types of data we have there. What do we mean by visual data? Well, I know um, coming from a mapping type of background myself, I would say, well, that's, that's the, the visual maps would be clearly there. But um, there are other forms of communication. We have the media. We have photo photographic material. And this becomes like a type of iconography of visual data. This image from this, this uh, country um, became quite famous some years ago um, during the Great Northeast uh, tsunami, uh, earthquake and tsunami that um, happened in, along the northeast coast. This photograph was taken and it had been used as an example of a moving image that conveys many different feelings and different ways of communicating. What was going on here is the question. And so we, we actually construct around this image different thoughts and ideas that becomes a form of data. So visual data, there's some more visual data. This was taken uh, just um, in, in Beira, the city with the disease epidemics, which also had a major cyclone last year. The city of Beira was hit, hit by cyclone Idai. And uh, these are pictures that I took in the city. But I took these cities before the cyclone. 
And then I took some more after the cyclone. And I can't see much difference before and after. But this was a major cyclone. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a, a living environment that for many is actually the same before as after. Though this isn't to uh, suggest for one minute that the cyclone didn't bring huge amounts of uh, human suffering, suffering to that community. But it, it raises questions how, what sort of images are communicating. There are other types of representations and this, this table, I won't uh, delay on it any longer just to say that as we put disaster and conflict risks together, for example, uh, we start to um, notice that if you go just straight to the bottom here, you'll see emphasizing sustainable conflict risk reduction, that it depends what type of risk reduction we're talking about in conflict zones, environmental security, environmental access, if you're looking at the environment, but if you're looking at society, it would be peace building, trust and cooperation, societal well-being. But if you're looking at this in terms of growth and economies, you'd be more interested in the mutual survival of the nation state. So we're communicating different emphases as we go through the information we collect and utilize. There's scoping for data that mediates in inter inter interdependent risks and risk and resilience, therefore, is a function of these processes of change in development interests, emergent and resurgent disaster risk, individual and collective well-being. And uh, this is uh, the sort of data which might be, uh, have, have strong utility in terms of um, risk reduction. Okay, keep. I think I'm nearly out of time, so uh, I'll move quickly now to uh, some concluding points. Uh, we are actually there. So there's some de derived principles for, for action data, and this is to address the nature of future survivability. This material, these points, um, for people who, who work at the sort of intersection between uh, science and humanity, this will be quite um, straightforward material. Yes, you need to be informed, people-centered, practitioner-orientated, proactively engaged, guided where possible by the lessons learnt related to localized knowledge and invested in. There's some more concluding um, as we move towards the, the, the conclusions to this talk, um, key points that come out of it. Local level action data uh, that is evidence-based it is evidence-based. So we're at a point where we can say we have evidence for this as well. It's not just speculative. We know that a whole of society approach is the shift that we are currently seeing. We know that understanding the everyday is as important to as understanding the rapid onset event. And we know that embedding principles of resilience and well-being is a way of doing disaster prevention. So there's evidence for some of this. We are doing much in terms of people working together in, in this sector, much more than was the case historically through, um, exam for example, alliance building. And then we have the implications that come out of this, therefore. So I just have these last three uh, sort of concluding summary slides. Action data implications, working with both the real and perceived risk, application of precautionary principles, awareness of open and closed systems for prediction and response calculations, the communication issues cross-culturally, and then the need for adaptation of disaster risk reduction applications comes with this. Transitioning from a linear supply-driven approach to our data to finding unique solutions for unique times and unique places with unique people. The second summary slide says that action data implications are along the lines of this needs to be uh, all types of data which is effective, but where it's a voice for people. Digitally enhanced would fall into that category. Data accountability and visibility for sustainable futures. And then all this time asking what data makes a difference across multiple stakeholders data that can be transformed into action data, sometimes by just doing it a little bit differently, 
and then more in-depth awareness of the importance of data hitherto unexamined for disaster of risk reduction. And I'll end there in saying that measuring and understanding the nature of future survivability is part of what this action data is all about. Very exciting, a lot of opportunities because there's so much work go good work going on. And this talk was really just to reflect on the role of data and how we might uh, apply and use our efforts to the best we can. So thank you very much.